and thank you for the introduction. And most all of that information was accurate. My name is Matthew Rice. I'm the Scotland Director for the Rights Group. I just happened to do my own introduction. It settles me. Um, as always, I, I, I like to kind of start with a little bit of interactive um, uh, showing of hands. So if you get to know uh, how many of you have heard of Open Rights Group before the event was advertised, um, that's great. Liz and literally the people who are part of Open Rights Group, fantastic. Um, and actually, so uh, and hands up, keep your hands up if you're if you're members of Open Rights Group. Yeah, and you pay your dues to to, to um, stay. On the well, actually, you don't need to be on the list, but if you're donate, a donator to, to the Open Rights Group as well, it's always good to know if there are funders in the room. Um, and hopefully, Ed, we've already taken a step to introduce a few more people to Open Rights Group. We are a um, digital rights campaigning organisation, there's 3,000 members and it's, uh, across the UK. Uh, we primarily work on uh, issues of uh, privacy free speech and government surveillance. Um, but in this particular talk, we've got a little bit of background, a little bit of, uh, and a growing interest in the way that democracy is changing uh, as a result of technology, both in the way of the use of personal data in campaigning, but also the use of um, technology to facilitate votes. Um, and we've had a little bit of research that we've done in the past that we'll, we'll get to uh, We're grassroots members. Those who had their hands up earlier are um, members of our, our average local group um, meet semi-regularly and anybody is always welcome to, to come along and, uh, and attend their own meetups. Um, but the reason why we're here in the Sir Ian Wood building is to discuss uh, electro electronic voting. And the reason why we're discussing it in the Scottish context um, is there is, I mean, there's three distinct kind of reasons that are some quite, uh, quite recent developments as well. So, uh, in 2016, uh, the Scotland Digital Strategy, the Scottish Government committed to trial and electronic voting. Um, and this earlier this year, the Scottish Government in consultation on electoral reform asked citizens whether they would like to see electronic voting um, embedded in, in as well. Um, the results of that consultation we'll discuss later on um, in, the, in the presentation. And then finally, and the reason why we're very, very, very particularly here is that Aberdeenshire and Highlands Council's procurement of an electronic voting system. Um, that was uh, procured, or began to be procured uh, in August, uh, and I believe there, there has been a, a bit accepted, but I don't know if that is Maybe if anybody who has contacts with the council can give me a heads up. Um, what I want to do with this uh, presentation uh, is briefly introduce uh, this talking about what it is that, what are the conditions that uh, an election um, has to satisfy in terms of an individual's vote and the challenges that uh, an electronic voting um, system will, will face. Uh, also, doing a little bit of kind of does technology solve social problems? Uh, we're going to look at some research uh, from across other parts of the world about whether or not electronic voting improves turnout. That's one of the core drivers of the Scottish Government's initiative. Um, and so it's going to be key uh, to the success of failure of electronic voting. Uh, both in Scotland but generally around the world. We'll also touch on open registry research in the past and go into e voting's conditional problems and what I maintain is e voting's unsolvable problem. Um, and throughout, I'm happy to take questions or if you'd rather save them to the end, you can save them to the end. Um, so, to begin, what are the conditions that any vote needs to satisfy, regardless of the kind of end? Well, it needs to balance itself out across these three somewhat kind of competing conditions. You have to make sure that the vote can be anonymous, but it, that it can also be verifiable while ultimately remaining secure. And each of these conditions are somewhat, they're almost in some cases competing, um, particularly the kind of anonymity and verifiability aspect of it. And the methods that we've used currently, polling place and postal voting, um, have pros that like positives and drawbacks in exactly these conditions as well. Um, electronic voting is going to have to satisfy and work itself into these conditions and there are some unique challenges that come from the nature of it being an electronic deployment. Um, 
going into our social issues, first of all, um, electronic voting has been tried in a few different places around the world. Uh, two of the best uh, spots for research took place in Norway and in Estonia. Uh, in Norway, um, there was a trial in 2011 and 2013 that had uh, also the Norwegian Social Science uh, Institute produced quantitative and qualitative research. Um, the trials took place in 10 of Norway's 459 municipalities, um, and they were looking at did more in the quantitative side of things, did more people turn out, and uh, was there was there an improvement, and in the qualitative side of things, was there uh, a change in the way that people appreciated the vote um, uh, and how how their vote took place. So in Norway, we saw that 89 percent of internet voters responded that they would have voted even in the absence of an online voting option. So the majority of people that took e-voting as a method would have voted anyway, although interestingly that 10% of people would have, or just over 10% said they would not have. Uh, additionally, the analysis that concluded that the trials did not have a significant effect on voter turnout, that 11% based on the number of social science model uh, was not sufficient enough. When they looked at the qualitative aspects of it. One of the kind of drivers for electronic voting is this idea that it will improve youth turnout. The biggest problem that, uh, that we're facing now is a kind of crisis in democracy and participation when it comes to younger voters. Um, the idea being that if you can vote on your phone, um, you will attract a, a more youthful demographic because they're so used to using electronics. Um, when the Norwegians did their research, what they found is that younger voters found it important Social path to walk to the polling place. So there was a sign of maturity. There was kind of like a driver's license or something like that. There was a kind of there was a symbolic kind of matured maturation that took place. Um, and so the, the number of people that were actually taking the electronic voting method were not necessarily the youth of the demographic, but other people, the people that are suffering from uh, accessibility issues. Um, the other leading country, in the country that leads uh, these often when it comes to discussing anything to do with kind of, uh, electronics uh, or technology in the public sphere is Estonia. They've been operating electronic voting since 2005 in their general elections. Um, we'll come to their research that the Open Rights Group have done um, uh, in Estonia in the past, uh, further on in the, uh, in the talk. Um, there was an analysis that was done in the University of Groningen that looked at the turnouts um, from 2005 in the um, the elections that have taken place in Estonia um, since since electronic voting has been introduced. The uh, research showed that there was no effect on internet voting on voter turnout, even if the use of internet voting increased during that time period. So there was an increase in a third of people in Estonia now use e-voting as their, as their preferred method of voting, but the absolute number of people voting is remains relatively the same. And interestingly, when it comes to discussing who's doing the voting online, the biggest jump um, of uptake were in the 55 plus demographic. So it was people who didn't want to necessarily walk to the polling stations. So again, didn't see a youthful immediate turnout uh, there either. Um, and that's you know it's something that's going to have to be grappled with. I, you, you can understand the intuitive nature that electronic voting, it's modern, it should suit like a new modern kind of lifestyle, but in actual fact, and um, it seems like the practice is slightly different um, in the end. So going into our open rights groups research, we've had two, uh, two different kind of research paths. One was focusing on trials that took place in the United Kingdom. This is where we begin to talk computer stuff, and um, no longer the social issues. And the other one was in Estonia, uh, during, uh, as we were part of a group of independent researchers that uh, visited um, in 2009. 11. So in the first instance, there were e-voting trials across England in 2007, and the Open Rights Group were a technical observer status. And so we visited three of the five online voting systems in England, that was in Russia, Sheffield, and Swindon, and one for each provider of the electronic voting systems, which was OptiVote, which is now iDocs, Tata, and ESNS, the election systems and software. Um, the findings of the research in 2007 were that uh, there was no ability for a technical observer to see what the servers were doing. Uh, the votes 
were seen to be downloaded and counted on uh, machines controlled by supplier staff without candidates, agents, or observers' ability to, to examine. Uh, one of the things around um, the current voting system is, in case those of you who haven't been electoral agents, that's fine if you haven't been, I'm not going to hold that against you. Um, the process of keeping an eye on a ballot as it travels across um, into from the polling place into, accounting, uh, into the counting space and through the counting desk and onto the different kind of uh, tables that you see uh, often in Sunderland because they win that race every year, right, or every, every general election. Um, at, what, at some point there is an agent or a human from both sides or from all candidates watching that polling taking place, seeing what's, seeing what's happening. And it's part of the reason why we have, that we have this kind of trust that's placed. It's not a kind of blind trust, it's based on the fact that all parties are able to see the same amount of uh, the same count that's taking place. If one uh, candidate is unhappy, they get to call for a recount, and, or, and other people could, and then there's further independent observers that aren't tied to any particular party. It's incredibly, there are so many eyeballs on one piece of ballot that for the technical observations from 2007, for the inability to see how servers were operating um, and the kind of proprietary nature that often these uh, electronic voting systems operate around, which means that suppliers, staff are the only members of the team that can actually access these times, um, had left with some, some real concerns. Um, the other part was that there was a um, no methods that were provided to verify the security and actual accuracy of the software used, nor the results that the software produced. Um, so in particular, in Russia, where the box considers it was shown to be running software which would be vulnerable to attacks, uh, allowing an attacker to steal authentication details that had been submitted, monitor how users had cast their votes, or modify the ballot appearance uh, to throw the election results as well. Um, as part of a uh, freedom of information request, or received the different software inventories for the software uh, for a site box. Um, we can't really do. You can't. Really, I've got my. I've got my the, uh, here. You can't really say much about uh, these are kind of proprietary softwares. Uh, Skittle is one of the providers out there. You can't say much about their systems and their applications about what V1.5 means. But in 2005, um, or sorry, in 2007. Using Oracle's database, the 10.20 10 and 10.12, there had been vulnerabilities that had been discovered there uh, that should have been patched. It would have been patched with further software updates that hadn't been updated. And then also uh, a patching web server is not at 9.99 in their versions. Um, and so there was a problem around how people were kind of accounting themselves to what systems were being used, how they were being used, allowing for then technical observations to uh, to make assessments about the security and uh, reliability uh, of some of these installations. Um, the other part that's quite kind of interesting to this is that it kind of, what it shows is that often when you're talking about electronic voting, there's this kind of sense that it just comes out of this special section of technology development, which is the electronic voting section. It's not true. These things still run on Apache. They run on Oracle. Bad server configurations happen. It's not simply you know, uh, Pony X Core V1.5 and you're done, right? Like, you're, it's still a technical infrastructural problem about how you implement these things. Uh, you know, they're still running on Firefox V2.0.0.3 as well. Uh, and so you, it's, you're introducing electronic voting into the already, you're introducing it into the environment that we understand. There's not a separate and special electronic voting kind of ecosystem. Sorry, just to clear on this. Um, so each one of these lines is a separate software component. Yeah. They're not alternative components. They're all, all of them being, being used as part of the, the one thing. Yeah, but that's the software inventory for the, for, uh, yeah, so the site box iteration. Um, so yeah, not, not, not competing. This was, uh, I don't think it was, a, I don't think it's a full um, articulation of what was being used, but it was, as much as we could get with the information request. Um, so, and then when it was coming down to it, um, looking at kind of the amount of information that was provided to candidates and their agents were insufficient to be able to verify that any meaningful 
extent that the results were accurate before accepting their declaration. So that's because of the lack of being able to access servers, because of this kind of problem of you've gone from paper to digital and you haven't figured out a way that you can continue to maintain that level of eyeball and to eyeball and eyeball paper contact or eyeball to mobile contact. Um, and the Electoral Commission had agreed with that assessment as well, saying that while there was no direct evidence of fraud, it was fortuitous that manipulation did not occur because the security and quality assurance and training for running the electronic voting systems were not suitable. Um, and at the time, 2007, the, the Electoral Commission's conclusion was that no further trial should be run until those processes had been approved and put in place to be practiced widely. Um, and as I was saying, when we're thinking about this, there is a material difference that we have to grapple with between what happens in a ballot box and what happens on a server. Um, it is very difficult once a vote hits the box for manipulation to occur, um, whereas when a vote reaches the server, that's just the beginning of what could be some problems that need to be, uh, that need to be looked at. And that's where Org's research in the Estonian context uh, and as I said, even if e-voting machines were uh, coming, or even if e-voting was coming from a different, were just fine, they are also attaching themselves to third party uh, groups or third party, they're relying on security individual, uh, like sorry, security staff who are attaching their own devices or their own computers in there. So there was a uh, discussion, or there was a paper about earlier this year where ESNS, one of the providers of the electronic voting trials had tried to be running, their security staff were running their security from um, VPNs. So it was in a person's home and they were VPN into the electronic voting solution. So all of a sudden you essentially have to then assess whether or not this individual's home was secure enough to guarantee the democratic trust and integrity of the election. Um, which wasn't, was not part of the threat vector. So this may be a bit more of the kind of horror stories about electronic voting than like how this could work, but I'm very willing to, to hear the how this could work. But we need to we need to kind of air this these problems and these kind of these uh, twists to, to begin to figure out whether or not it's truly a, a, the right way to go. Um, so in the Estonian research, uh, Open Rights Group formed part of a uh, independent group of observers, um, many of them who were experts from the US, the University of Michigan, um, to observe the Estonian the 2014 election. Um, so the conclusion in the, uh, in, from the peer-reviewed group's work was that Estonia's system places complete trust in the user's device and the servers, in the casual server, which is two of the more vulnerable areas uh, that you'd be introducing electronic voting. Um, and were sources of concern for the authors of the report. Um, we were talking earlier about how the Estonian, uh, the Estonian kind of e-citizen model works. Um, we brought up that there is a card cryptographic <coughs> that every single citizen of Estonia is able to use to access many of the public services. That includes um, their vote. So. The same card that they would install to look at their health records, I think is one of the things that they can do, or pay their taxes, or generally do something civic minded. Uh, it's the same card they would put in um, when it comes around to, to place their vote. The frequency of the use of the card was a vector for attack, um, according to the authors of the report. So, what would happen is that, or what could happen, is that if you had uh, install the keylogger onto an individual's machine to be able to run it. A secure pin is always sent to um, is sent to the citizen for to place to kind of write in this is your vote. This is the kind of two back authentication. Here's the pin that you need to use. The keylogger uh, is all that needs to be uh, on in place to receive the pin. The individual places their vote. The next time the card goes in, that attackers were able to open the e-voting system in the background so they could be, say, going back online to pay their taxes or checking on their health records. The attackers were able to go back online, open up um, the e-voting in the background, use the pin that had already been, that had been used because the system allowed for any for the last vote to count, so was, you were able to vote as many times as you wanted, which was a kind of selling point of the kind of direct democracy. 
it actually turned out to be potential risks there. Um, and changeable that was then not detectable by either of the systems that were, uh, that were in place. Um, so the other side of things were the counting side. So you, that's one vote for one person that can be changed. But the bigger problem that the, um, that the authors discovered was that there were server side errors and it could be it could be attacked as well. So in this case, um, using software DVDs used to install the operating systems on all the election servers, the code, uh, you could ensure that the basic checks used to ensure the integrity of the software would still appear to pass despite the software having been modified. And um, once that software had been modified, the attacks would be able to replace the results of the vote decryption process with the attacker's preferred set of votes, silently changing the results. Um, and because the votes were decrypted uh, and counted in the unobservable black box, so and, and that inability to actually see how these votes are coming in, what was cast as intended, what was counted as was cast, and, and then ultimately uh, recorded, and uh, recorded as counted, and um, there was an ability to change at scale the votes in the stolen election. Um, so this, to the authors, the risk for it was very real, um, and the authors were deeply concerned. And that it appears in a peer reviewed journal. While the Sony government had an interest in saying, no, it's absolutely fine, there's no problem here, there were some changes that took place. Um, the authors, including Open Rights Group, still have concerns about how the, uh, the high voting system runs. Um, but of course, Estonia has a great price or a great amount of credit put into their uh, kind of bank around using electro uh, electronic systems and being digital first, so they continue to do so. Um, so returning to these three conditions for a vote to take place, it's important to reflect um, to reflect on them when we look at the other core arguments for electronic voting. So some would say, and I've had it asked of me this week, uh, that if we can bank and shop online, then we should be able to vote online. It should be that simple. But it's a different order problem. So if you can shop online, that's no problem. Uh, Amazon knows your last 10 purchases. You probably want them to in many ways, or some version don't. But uh, you definitely want your bank to know your last 10 purchases. It helps with fraud checks. What you never want is a person to know the last 10 votes you cast. You never want to have a history of how you interacted um, uh, with when that democratic process took place. Right? The secret ballot remains kind of the key function um, and took so much to achieve that function um, uh, before kind of arriving at the way that we do things now. So to discuss things as if we can retail and bank uh, online, then we should simply be able to vote. Uh, fails to acknowledge this need for anonymity um, across also the security and verifiability. And that's obviously where the kind of problem comes in. You can keep your money in your in your account, in your locker, but you still you want to be able to then identify yourself so you can access the account in your locker, right? Um, and, and, and take that money. But you don't want to be able to do that with your, with your voting record. You certainly don't want to have Situation where anybody else would prove who you voted for uh, without uh, a huge amount of benefit. Um, some uh, argue that these problems are quantifiable and solvable um, through the use of technologies like blockchain um, or using cryptographic technology like MixNet to secure uh, these, these conditional problems. Um, and perhaps they're right. And in particular in solving those conditional issues of security and anonymity and verifiability. Um, but you, the use of that technology and the adoption of that kind of way of, of solving these problems introduces what is, uh, in my opinion, electronic voting is unsolvable. The disgruntled losers. Um, now, in fact, neither of these people lost their elections uh, or their referendum. But the premise of why votes are accepted is not because the winner says they won, it's because the loser accepted they lost. If you're in a position where there is a level of a lack of understanding that can be exploited to any degree, um, you leave yourself open to the disgruntled loser. So before Trump won, um, he'd already started talking about how there was rigs going on at polling places. And prior to the Brexit referendum, half of the voters believed that the 
E referendum is going to be rigged. We already have incredibly articulate um, politicians who are standing up and have communities that are backing their rhetoric. If they stood up at the end of the night and said we lost because uh, because the votes were rigged and they were rigged because they were stuck in a machine and we can't test the machine, how likely would it be that somebody comes on and goes, it's not a problem, all I have to tell you about is the whole market encryption that we're running um, and I'm sure you guys will go home happy. And of course, we'll just explain very simply using Scrabble uh, how blockchain is an unalterable ledger. It would just go down so horribly that it, it leaves you in a position of like, you have to think about it. not the best of us, not the person who most wants to supports the, the, the outcome of the vote, it's the person who doesn't want to trust the vote. How do you satisfy them? Um, and unfortunately, I mean, it's probably not the, this is probably not the best audience to start talking about the lack of ability for people to understand uh, computers and technology, but the vast majority of people struggle to take in um, some of those intricate, uh, those intricate measures and may be inclined to call file when file wasn't there. And um, they're not right. Neither of these people were necessarily correct, but it doesn't matter. They whether or not they were loudest and they were convincing. And that's part of it. May not, it may be solvable in some way, but at the moment, it's not a technological problem that holds back evil. Team. It is a social problem. It's the ability for people to kind of trust the nature of technology and the ability for politicians to take, uh, take to, to allow results to be recorded or counted as the way that they can be counted. So, to kind of begin to summarize before we then begin to look at how Scotland has gone around this. Electronic voting needs to be secure, anonymous, and verifiable, but this is, a difficult, this is difficult to achieve in an electronic deployment because of some of the kind of competing conditions that we see. Um, it doesn't necessarily improve turnout as well. Um, it introduces security vulnerabilities, and I should add, at scale uh, into the voting process, um, and ultimately provides an opportunity uh, for beginning to dispute the outcome. Um, any questions so far? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the um, credibility of the uh, Estonian system. Mm -hmm. Have they actually found any fraud? Um, not that I know of. Um, they, they did have to make changes both to the iVoting <coughs> system for the, for the next election that they are running and there was also a problem with the cryptographic card that they were using so there had to be a number of recalls to reinstall the cards because there had been a vulnerability that was discovered in the hardware and there has not been there hasn't been any there hasn't been any discovery of fraud that, that had taken place um, and so part of the part of the dispute uh, between the Estonian government and the, the authors of the report is that Exactly that. There is no practical evidence that any dispute uh, that any fraud had taken place, um, and that it was too theoretical for it to be uh, genuine, a genuinely practical measure that, that needed to be that could result in undermining the, the outcome of the elections. Um, but the, the research is what the research is. I mean, and it's, it's I think it's up to people to be read, to read it to decide whether or not they feel it's a feasible, whether they are feasible uh, vectors of attack. Um, and I think you know one of the one of the things that we, a lot of countries, particularly countries like France and the Netherlands, they have undertaken threat assessments that have led them to shut down some of the ways, some of the electronic voting solutions that they had, particularly for overseas um, for overseas counting, citing cybersecurity concerns. Um, additionally, uh, the Electoral Commission in Quebec had shut down citing security concerns too. Um, None of, none of those countries had seen that there were fraud taking place, but I think it was the fevered environment that they found themselves in that led them to make the kind of call that the benefits, the cost side of the benefits at this stage because of the way uh, cybersecurity is rolling out, particularly when it comes to elections, uh, that, that they need to they need to take that step. So I actually haven't, I, I don't know of any provable fraudulent activity that's taken. But there have been concerns, um, particularly in, in the Philippines, where there were genuine elections, like real elections, not, not just trials. And the same problem happened where proprietary technology, only supplier staff were allowed in. A server, the timing on the server changed, um, which 
left center, who I don't think understood like the server architecture particularly well, but he was genuinely concerned that something had changed, he didn't understand what changed, no one else was able to tell him what had changed, how the hell did this change, what could have changed as a result of that server, and that server kind of rebooting and changing its time. Um, uh, and that's that's exactly that kind of issue, right? It's, kind of, it's the unknown quantity of the, the problem that's, that's left people uh, scared, I suppose. Sorry, like uh, this of the US election, I remember the many like there like, are no particular evidence for this is what people are saying that when they voted for it was part of their history was too close to be mathematical. Yeah. Well, so I think um, so. The most recent thing that I saw, and it's important to set, to distinguish between um, voting online using uh, electronic devices and then the kiosk system that is often used in state elections and, and, and in the U.S. So the most recent problem that came up with the in the elections in the, in the United States that you might be referring to. So uh, a polling card in the U.S. for these Senate elections that are currently taking place is about 16 pages long. Uh, and the kiosks are set up to allow for an all-party vote. So you can just say, all 16 pages turn to Republican, all 16 pages please be Democrat. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm glad I keep you that in rapture and you didn't need one in. <laughs> um, what people have been doing was that the, the, the race conditions have not been set properly. Who's the one next to us? Next to you guys, this one. Yes. Uh, the race conditions have not been set properly, so people are turning their device, turning the wheel, hitting enter, saying all party Republican. Uh, the, and then subsequently turning the wheel again for whatever reason, and hitting enter again, and then votes were changing. So somebody had been wanted to all party vote for um, Democrats, and it came out that they voted for Ted Cruz, Republican Senator. Um, as part of it, because the race conditions had not been set appropriately, and there had been competing requests that had gone through, and so servers were started, the kiosks were starting to count that turn and change as another, as like another countable vote. And um, that was actually a problem that was discovered like back in 2010, but the uh, the providers of the electron voting system had not decided to make any changes. And interestingly, there was no, there's no laws in the states. To say, you know, that, that a state could, could compel one of their providers to update their systems. To say, you need now, you now need to get some like a new level of cybersecurity. You know, and that could be an option there for the, in the Scottish government terms uh, to make some of their providers accountable for installing and keeping up to date those systems. Because at the moment, in the U.S., where uh, where they're most prevalent, the providers are still running systems from uh, 2010 that have 2000. Problems and stuff. Um, yeah, but, but America as a democracy has got a whole bunch of things that are there. <laughs> That's not something I'm going to have to cut out. Like, genuinely, election observers don't like to go to America. It's not a great, it's not a great test case. <laughs> All the way from voter ID down to like how the votes are cast. And um, most independent election observers are put in the US and lower down the league table than you'd expect. Um, so that's, and that is why, like some of the Scandinavian and Soviet countries, like Norway and Estonia, are actually really good models to look at. And they have a different way of like appreciating the kind of issues. And, and, and so that's why I go to them first rather than going to the American experience. Can I ask you, so the Estonian system is it one of the systems that's essentially the private system of body from somewhere else, or is it kind of put in the Estonian? Um, so there are still there are still it's still a uh, provider. So there's still an independent yeah there's still a provider. Um, I believe it's I can't, well maybe I shouldn't say that because I, I think it's Smartmatic, but there is definitely a provider that's in Smartmatic. Yeah. It's Smartmatic. Yeah. 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 Cybernetic. Cybernetic. Yeah. Cybernetic. Thanks. Sorry, Thanks. No, I need to keep the record. The the record that. Yeah. Election detail. Yeah, that's always useful to have in the room. Um, Matthew, can I ask about the election detail? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's the situation in Australia? I've gotten back on my list and crossed from both ends to the same. Is that electronically based? 
Um, there were trials in the past, I believe it was for elephant counting, but not elephant counting. Well, I think they brought elephant voting in a number of states, some of Australia, for voters with disabilities or voters who are in the military. And I believe, some of the programs, this is dangerous, um, I believe the state government of Victoria have committed to taking forward online voting for everybody. That, that was the last I heard, but I haven't heard anything very recent on this. I just wondered, because there must be quite a high level of postal movement if it was still. Um, okay. Right, so the numbers, the numbers you take up. Yeah, so I think uh, it would be interesting to know. I don't know how many people with disability needs, like that kind of number of people with disability needs, how many they have any took electronic voting versus postal voting. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, it was points out like it's not there for all. Yeah. Voters, it's for specific categories of voters, then um, it's not clear. Uh, I do remember that there were some electoral commission issues about some of the counting, but not with the voting, that it was further down the line about how some of the counting took place. Uh, but it was a state based um, system. And of course, Scotland has had e counting for the past, uh, past few election cycles, and the error rates have dropped considerably um, since, since that's been introduced. Um, another thing to bear in mind, though, is when we begin to talk about electronic counting, is that there is always a paper trail there that's attached. So if you need to down if you need to down tools, electronic tools, and pick up a pen and paper and start counting, then, then that's always there. And um, it's part of the e counting model. Um, to begin to kind of move back towards some of the kind of social concerns, not concerns necessarily, but how people are appro approaching the opportunity for electronic voting. The Scottish government had run a consultation uh, earlier this year. And the outcome analysis of that has been published um, earlier this month. And the two key questions, and um, to use my laser completely unnecessarily because you can see the questions. But, um, so if internet or mobile voting is available, would you choose that rather than voting at a polling position by post? So that's internet voting versus other voting methods. And then the other question, if internet or mobile phone voting is available, would you more likely to vote? So that and that is internet voting as uh, as a kind of attractive model with that, would that make you want to vote full stop? The outcomes um, were that a narrow percentage um, said that they would not uh, choose internet mobile phone voting uh, over um, over polling places or by post, um, and so it didn't compete. It, it competed very closely with and um, with polling places or by post. But when it came to would would you make would it be more likely to make you vote full stop? Um, there was a much more kind of resounding response, which is that the existence or non-existence of electronic voting for 65% of the respondents, uh, it was not going to, to encourage them to be more likely to vote. Um, which begins to kind of speak to that issue of like, does technology solve social problems? Um, just technology on its own, again, it's often seen in that case, just technology on its own will not drive uh, kind of the need for, for increased democratic participation based on, based on these survey results. Um, uh, there are further factors that need to be taken into account, um, but it does play a role, um, and where where that role fits is is where the Scottish government wants to move. So the outcome statement from the Scottish government is that the uh, the government's going to be considering when and when trials might take place and what the scope should be in further announcement will be we'll dated in due course. I'm sure you're not ready to make any announcements. Yeah, I haven't. I wrote that, by the way. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the author I is in the room. Um, so in which case, can you go back one slide? Yeah. The 35% who would be more likely to vote, do we know if they were people who voted or didn't? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's unclear. It wasn't, that's we, not part of it. No, so that wasn't the question that were part of the presentation. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other questions, um, so, so I suppose you could say, well, there's 35% that said you would be more likely to vote. Mm -hmm. so in a world where you're at uh, determined this sort of running in Scotland between 35 and maybe 55%, that's actually quite a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If you asked me, do I believe that that would actually result in the turnout increase of that amount? Well, not really. 
because then we would be at record levels of turnout. Yeah. And yeah. the first half of the that was there, and I was there, and it's just it's fun. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no getaway, you know, Scotland, Scotland's not suffering any more than others. Uh, in fact, Scotland's probably one of the more recent uh, success stories. The Scottish and Spanish referendum remains the highest turnout in the UK of any referendum that's taken place, um, about 84% of the registered four and a half million voters. Um, of course, when we go into other discussions around council elections, you're looking at kind of between in the 30s and 40s, and that's really where the part that that's really where the problem lies. It's not in these big um, big ticket referendum moments, it's the kind of day to day and then you really the future councillor things like that. It's been a problem to try and keep people um, involved. Um, but it does speak to, you know, the referendum speaks to a kind of an argument that what really drives turnout is when people think that the, ma the change is going to matter, that, that it's going to affect them, that they see themselves in the, in, in the, in the debate as well. Um, and all these things are difficult to, to achieve and not necessarily, um, not necessarily necessary for technology to be involved. Although there is some opportunity to you know, think about how you can bring the democracy closer to the individual in interesting ways. Scotland has piloted participatory budgeting, which is where individuals are able to set a uh, percentage of their local council budget and using online um, methods to kind of vote on the different entities to do that. It seems to be very successful. Um, using kind of, perhaps using kind of forums from which you can uh, like uh, participation forums, democratic participation forums, where information is placed up and people are able to argue and debate on those, have also shown to be quite successful. Um, but both of those are the kind of, both of those are going over and above and going way past the method of the vote that really matters. It's about it's kind of different ways that you engage a person's kind of uh, interest. The downside of that, uh, yeah. William, you still there for one um, <laughs> which is that um, I believe in one of the participatory budgeting models is packed. Yes. Just because you can, and, and the, as you rightly said, there's all these conditions that need to be met if we're going to do it for the government or even to the farm elections, perhaps, that are in that commercial. Either of those types of elections, it's seen as less important than yeah. participatory budgeting, so some, somebody went packed into the system. Yeah. And I think the challenge there is, is how to build credibility and, and deal, with the, deal with perception about the security and risk when you're actually putting out voting systems where people are doing things that are important for the democracy and they're going to act. Yeah. That doesn't seem to me to be a good one. No. Could you say something about um, the use of phone? To, um, sorry, I, 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 um, just recently, I donated some money to a um, thing um, for, a, for a whole of people walking and said you had to text 7901 to the block. And that seemed to work remarkably well because I, I got my phone and I just texted this thing and lo and behold it said you have voted so you have done so and so for somebody. And it's a reassuring text message comes back right. who have done this. But has anybody done much, much work on that? Is it this, what is this electronic voting like? Is it that kind of thing that happens? Or is it more like when you go on your PC and something complicated happens? Because, I mean, when you look at it, this, this donating a large amounts of money um, to, to charitable causes is now regularly happening. People who vote for you know, the most popular sportsmen or something like that. So when I take your point about people not having confidence the thing is working, but there are these examples where something very similar seems to be going on and people are obviously quite confident about that. Right. So the idea that you yeah, you're able to use your phone to be voting in something like well, the Eurovision or things like that. Um, whether that test I mean, no one said any any research about people's kind of level of comfortability there. And I don't think to partly to Liz's point, you know, there had been discussions around how we need to make uh, we need to make our democracy more like the X factor, um, in terms of like the accessibility. 
And I would argue that you never want to make your democracy like the X factor. You never want to make it as um, superficial um, as, a, as a kind of process. Not to say that the votes for um, charitable, or even like in the professional body, so you know, you know, my dad who's a member of the BMJ, he uses, he uses electronic voting, a lot of unions use electronic voting, internal, even political parties use it in their, um, in their inter, uh, internal leadership elections. Um, but each of those, I suppose there's a, there's a, each one kind of satisfies and goes to some part of the problem, but there is a further sphere when it becomes general public, the general population, and it becomes a discussion about who is your representative and who is in the outcome of that election. Um, I think it definitely, it would definitely go to your point that people have become, have become more comfortable with the idea that they could cast something on their phone mm -hmm. and it is recorded. Um, but I just don't think the stakes have ever been so high that they genuinely <coughs> asked, well, how do I know that I voted the way, how do I know that my vote is kind of as it was, as I, as I cast it. Um, and then that, that condition is up that sort of that environment is only really kind of brought in when you begin to use it in the general What I'm trying to get at is rather than thinking that everybody has to download some very complicated app and there is some enormously complicated protocol for interchanging the signals backwards and forwards, mm. this opens up the possibility that you could um, you know, you could use some kind of vulnerability in the underlying software in the same way that ransomware works and so on. But, well, if you're back down at the level of just texting something, which is after all a process which is used on a colossal scale all over every day, uh, and, and if you could use that kind of simplicity of software, it seems to be a lot less possibility of. Um, you know, doing, doing complicated cyber fraud and, and all the rest. Um, I, 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 the <laughs> biggest threat is somebody, yes. somebody steals the phone. Yeah. Well, the password, so. yes. Most all those systems are quite happy for you to vote or to meet multiple things. Is, is the real problem that is, is the question of the identity that you are <laughs> Uh, it was, it was uh, going to be you weren't quite sure. I mean, after all, the charitable people aren't that worried precisely who yeah. is, is doing this money as long as the money itself actually goes across. Right. Right. And there's an audit trail. And you, you can obviously um, donate money again and again and again and again, but you don't want people to vote again and again and again and again. No, exactly. Uh, that's, that's the extra level of difficulty. So, yeah, so yeah the, the additional verifiability has often been. Um, it's often been the kind of outlier because you can normally achieve security and anonymity, um, and you can do that in pretty kind of profound ways to, to leave it to leave very little left to chance. But to then actually leave just enough for yourself to be able to for for a counter or for the electoral administration to verify that that vote is the vote of that person and it is the only vote that that person cast. That's that new order. That's that new order of problem. And um, it's interesting to think that maybe maybe more. Um, uh, maybe a lower tech network Ooh. could be a solution there, but it still has to satisfy how do you verify yourself when you get. Uh, so, for instance, in Estonia, their model is that because we have a national ID card, we can begin to ver like verifiability is becoming easier. What would you do? How would we do this in Scotland? Would we begin to think about it as will we accept driver's licenses? Perhaps not. Voter ID is a big issue um, uh, in America. It's political issue in America, and the trials that have taken place in England have not gone particularly well. Um, so how you how you begin to begin to, to establish that identity piece um, outside of you know, getting your polling card, walking to the polling place, getting your polling card, using it in, the, in your postal vote, is a um, thing that speaks, would begin to cause problems with your the, the kind of model that you've got to Aspect of that, I think, probably comes into the reason why you want to be right because you're actually looking at this as the aspect of choice. Like, has somebody voted in something like the uh, like giving money for the first charity? That's just a choice that you have. You can do that or you cannot do that. You choose to accept that or you can do that. Or this is not a choice. This is imposed on you by government or given this is the option by government. So like there's this aspect of like you can either engage with those systems or not, but 
I would possibly give you consistent if you want to do it this way. That might be, I think that's the best way. Perhaps, yeah. I mean, I don't think we're ever in a situation where electronic voting will be replacing any of the systems that we currently have. I think polling place remains symbolically um, and, and actually, and also from a security perspective, the, you know, one of the places that people will feel most comfortable. And also, if you, if you want to get rid of the you know, dogs at polling places every election cycle, everyone loves dogs at polling places. Um, we set of pictures. <laughs> but yeah, so nothing's quite, and, and actually to kind of go to it, a lot of economic models for some of the pros for electronic voting often say that it will save money in the long run, but in actual fact, for electoral administration, it will, it, it, there's no way at this stage that it will begin to save money. You're adding a third part or a third track for voting that would just be an additional cost. It may recoup at a certain point, and a lot of the models also assume that there isn't more any, any more costs that are foreseen that are coming down the line, like particularly like licenses. Uh, when you're talking about working from a, for a proprietary software, they're going to ask you. You can buy our systems this time, and when you need an update, you can pay us again for that update. And when we have a critical vulnerability, we can definitely serve your critical vulnerability for a hefty price tag as well. Um, so it often, I think, it, it has it will it will eventually have to, it will have to play. In the field of other methods. Well, I'm thinking again, uh, I mean, I'm looking at the platform on power so we look for, I mean, we still vote, but vote, I mean, vote for example, in the local government uh, election, <coughs> where you have one, two, three voting system compared to binary option of this or this. So, that case, when I know people basically are supposed to like one, two, three, and when people put like one, 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 it's cancelled. So right. people like that a lot of time. I mean, thousands of votes are wasted yeah. because of not following the instruction. But with the electronic voting, if we don't do the right thing, the system will be dead. It's a good point. And yet, the single transferable vote system that Scotland has operated, there were some, there were, I mean, it wasn't a significant percentage, but there were some spoiled balance because people didn't understand. So it's not a huge number, but if you do, it is correct that if you were, if there was a software, if there was an interface in which you were making an error, or your vote wasn't, you know, you were trying to do one on one, so you had first preference three times, they would say, no, you have to choose your second preference. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would argue that um, most people are actually relatively intelligent, some of them, and some of them like to draw faces on the ballot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You'd have to have that facility built into Yeah, you would also have to, like, on a spoiler ballot. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I'd, I don't think, I think people are, I think it's surprising how often when you introduce even something like single transfer of vote, which is a, can be confusing on paper, it actually hasn't resulted too much confusion on paper. And um, people have been able to, to, to figure out how to do it. Um, but going into our very, very localized area, um, I realize, but this good, we can just keep on chatting. So earlier this, uh, sorry, it was in, this summer, this first of August, Aberdeen City Council and the uh, Highland Council had set up a procurement for provision of electrical services, which included um, electronic voting within polling stations, so that's kiosks, the kiosk model that we were talking about earlier, uh, telephone voting, SMS voting, and internet voting. Um, I wrote to the council to ask whether or not all of those conditions had been satisfied with the procurement, whether there was you know, anyone who's wasn't able to, you know, if there were any other methods of voting that, uh, that they were wanting to include or that they'd taken away. Apparently, the system and the preferred uh, uh, provider does have all of those um, components in there. And the uh, intention is to run internet voting um, or run this as an option in community council elections going forward. Um, I don't have any further information on it. and. Part of the reason why I'm in Aberdeen is to begin to kind of speak to people who might be, um, who might be given the option. 
sooner than most people, because we don't know, I don't think there's any other councils in Scotland that are making this kind of procurement in terms of the election geek for, for that. Um, there are. So community, online voting for community council elections has been going on for a number of years. This is a week 10 for them, and part of that would be exactly this is my understanding. So right. they've already been doing it, but I'm the week 10 of it recently. Oh, as in and the other councils, such as Edinburgh, have yeah. done it, and there's lots of others. And um, we've done it for community council elections. And there's a big challenge with community council elections, yeah. which is like participatory budgeting. How do you get people to turn out and vote? Sometimes it's not even a context. No. So you don't need to have an election because it's not a context. Are these supposed to be uh, secret ballots? Yep, they will. Telephone and SMS and not into any budget. This is very easy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they could very well be. Ian, I think there's a research project. No, but they're temporary. I would, I would hope there's some something in the envelope where if someone looks at it that it's been. I don't know. So then what? It's not It's a never arrive at the destination. You don't come to the destination. Yeah. 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 No, I mean there have been problems with coercion um, yeah. in terms of bond codes and things like that. Um, but coercion exists yeah. in all of these systems, right? It's, there's always a human. There can always be a, a human element that's introduced to the coercion. Um, Put a, a polling place you can prove that you're voting a particular one. There is with a telephone call, someone can listen to you making the vote. Yeah, perhaps. Um, and these, I mean, these are interesting questions. And, and maybe, um, in fact, it sounds like I, I saw this report in a way that was like this is an effort to introduce something new. But it might be that I misunderstood uh, that I, actually it's a new procurement and there isn't any. There is, this isn't necessarily a new initiative, but um, it, is an, it is the first one that we've seen since the kind of that electric, the electronic voting constitution taking place. It doesn't look like it's, these are these are separate aspects. This is completely down to Aberdeen and Highland Council's like opportunity. But those of you who are uh, registered voters in Aberdeen will have an opportunity to perhaps, I mean, providing that there's at least more than one candidate, uh, engage with something like this. Um, and part of it, what we're hoping to do, you know, Scotland's having this debate now and the consultation has gone the way it's gone and, and there's obviously more thought that's going into it um, from our very own election week. And, but the Welsh are also doing this and they are planning their, they're planning trials for electronic voting. So <coughs> in England, in fact, it looks like um, that has been put to bed that there, there is no plans to introduce uh, electronic voting back to the recent question uh, around introducing it for uh, accessibility purposes for those with disabilities. Um, and the government decided that it was not an appropriate thing to introduce. They weren't prepared to do it um, for, for many reasons we discussed around security um, and, and the, the, the trust that, that goes into it. So uh, these are devolved institutions mainly that are now trying to, to grapple with this area, uh, which makes it a kind of Interesting premise. Some people may not pay as much attention to how Scottish election or consultation goes as opposed to a kind of Westminster one, but that's why we're here, right? And that's why, um, and that's why partly, you know, what I want to begin to think about with uh, potentially interesting members from uh, BCS, but also thankfully our um, our own um, members in Aberdeen. This is not for the rest of the evening. Uh, and catch a train at some point. But what we want to begin to do is think about kind of all parts of the of the voting process. And you know, part of the issue that comes from electronic voting, and I think the kind of key first issue is that it often involves a procurement. It often involves proprietary systems, which is a unique thing to any other. Sure, you can go. You have to go to the electoral reform um, uh, services to get the papers printed for your postal vote. But it, that paper is not proprietary, so to speak. You can go and look at the paper, the paper is delivered to you, it is paper. 
um, when it comes to groups like Smartmatic and iDocs and uh, um, Cybernetica, these are private companies that have IP um, uh, interests. What does that mean when we begin to introduce that into a democratic process? Does it have to be open source necessarily to, to, to grant trust? Does that then mean there is no business case, there's no business opportunity for it because they want to maintain their proprietary systems? Is it an unfair thing to expect a company, a private company, to have that level of transparency when it comes to democracy? These are difficult questions that we want to begin to start kind of chewing over as Open Rights Group and as other members and, 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 and with other kind of professional bodies. Um, and particularly one of the one of the points that um, comes out of it as well of like how do we ensure that the system is operating correctly? Of course, how do you do that when it's a black box or some or a kind of grayish box? And also how to build in error identification and improvements given the time that takes place between deployments. Um, e counting in Scotland had a, had a rough start um, and didn't get another and the time between the next time it got another run out was quite long, but there would have been improvements made in that time. If the same system was being run from an electronic voting perspective, and you know the risks to it were essentially people's trust in the democratic integrity um, or the democratic process. If you have one bad election, what effect does that have? And how do you rebuild trust from that point on? Do you run the whole election again? That seems like a heavy price to pay. Um, or maybe it's the necessary price to pay. Do you just let it go and then hope that the next time it comes around in five years or four years, depending on um, uh, how often the government's fall? Um, how do you how do you then like reintroduce that? Um, it's one of these things where you don't really get that many shots at it. You kind of get one shot. Every, it's like a kind of bit of a moonshot. It's one shot every four years to kind of get the public to understand these things. So that's another unique challenge that comes from introducing this kind of technology. Um, and so, like I said, these are questions that are beginning to, to lead um, open rights in different directions. Um, we are particularly interested to hear from uh, individuals that may be involved, particularly from the British Computer Society that may be involved in procurement, to begin to try and assess systems and procuring systems and how far you get to go into understanding something before you can give it the clearer. Um, and if any members of either bodies any professional board was interested in much more, um, we'd be very happy to do it. These are acknowledgements for the purpose of copyright for some of the graphics that we use. Um, we have a, a general sign up to our mailing list of open rights, but if you were specifically interested in following up more to discuss um, electronic voting, please email myself at openrights.org. Um, it is a pressing concern, like this is coming quickly, and we want to move relatively quickly on this as well, begin thinking about this. Um, and so, any interest is always appreciated. Uh, and we have very nice people on all sides, of the, on like all sides of the debate and all sides of the implementation, like uh, Liz, who's, who's been able to travel up. Um, it's, it's, a fun, it's a fun debate to be involved in. It kind of it goes back and forth, and it's quite, and it is very thoughtful. John said at the very the head of this. And um, it is a question about how we make our democracy more accessible while also maintaining its trust. It's a tricky topic. And it's also a tricky topic, tricky topic from a security perspective. It's got the very, very interesting conditions that you have to satisfy. So from both of those perspectives, that's what we want to work on this. From a kind of political science, how do you keep people interested, how do you keep people trusted, and also from a technical perspective, how do you, you actually run this if you can run this if it's possible to call? Um, and, and maintain the, the standards that are uh, required. So, um, if there's any thoughts, please come forward. If not, that's me. Thank you very much for your time.